if, if you believe in the perfectibility of man argument, who's going to do the perfecting? It's not the individual, it's the state, yes? The elite is granted this magic power, the philosopher, philosopher king power to mold society as they deem fit. That's why the, the, the hoary old saying is so true. Big government, small citizen. The, the more you, 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 you cramp the individual and you remove from them the liberties we believe to be inherent and not, not government given, but God given, the more power you give to uh, an elite and unfortunately, in many cases, members of that elite aren't elected. And that's what we've seen in the last three or four years in America, that the, this concept of the deep state or the permanent state, these bureaucrats who say, well, presidents come and go, but I've been working in government for 20 years and I know better. That way, and this is not an exaggeration, that way eventually lies the re-education camps and eventually the gulag. How is the ideological basis of the far left fundamentally at odds with traditional and conservative values? What is the war for America's soul, as told in Dr. Sebastian Gorka's new book? And in the eyes of Dr. Gorka, how did we get to this point? How are American institutions radicalized and America's youth indoctrinated into sympathizing with socialist ideology? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Jan Jekielek. Today we sit down with Dr. Sebastian Gorka, the nationally syndicated radio host of America First, and former deputy assistant to President Donald Trump, to discuss his new book, The War for America's Soul. Dr. Seb Gorka, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thanks for having me, Jan. So you have written a book, uh, The War for America's Soul, provocatively titled. What is the America soul that the war is being raged about? Great. Well, first things first, uh, can I congratulate you and Epoch Times for the work you're doing, especially with regards to keeping the menace of the communist threat in front of us? And secondly, really almost single handedly doing the work into investigating the corruption of what I call Obamagate, where most of the mainstream media won't. So first things first, uh, you have an amazing team and, and more power to you. Um, this is my third book. Uh, my first was Defeating Jihad that I think helped me get into the White House. Then last year I wrote uh, Defeating America's Enemies. And now here, um, based upon personal experience, what happened to my family in the White House and afterwards, and then understanding just how radical one of our two parties had become, I wanted to explain how that occurred, the, the long story for how that occurred, the real explanation. And the soul of America that, that, that we are warring over, as for me, uh, as a legal immigrant to this country, is the collective principles, the first principles upon which this nation was founded by the Founding Fathers as the only nation in human history that wasn't the product of a dynasty, a linguistic group, a geographic accident, but based upon the principle of the individual and the God-given rights of the individual as what Reagan called that shining city on the, on the hill. So the soul of America for me is who we were at the founding as a republic and how we get back to that principled place of uh, liberty for all and fighting those who wish to denude us of our freedoms. You know, it it's fascinating to me because many of the people that you know you would say are trying to denude us of our freedoms themselves believe they're creating a better America. Yeah, I mean, th this is th that's no accident. These people come from the left, and you really can describe. It doesn't matter what the party's called, whether it's conservative, Tory, Republican, whether it's Democrat, Labour Party, Socialist. It doesn't matter what the labels are. Politics in the modern age is, is separated. Your identity falls on one question. What is your attitude to, to humans? Are humans fallen? Are they innately corruptible? Or are they perfectible? Can you create, can you engineer human beings into a utopia? I don't care whether you're Karl Marx or Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, the, the common thread, the connective tissue between an AOC and the founder of communism is this belief that human beings are just malleable, 
They're like animals. You can change them. You can engineer them. And you can create perfection on earth. If you're a conservative or whatever brand you are, you deny that and you say, man is fallen. Man, man it can never be perfected. All you do is you try to manage as best you can and preserve those things. That's what, where conservative comes from. You can serve those things that have been proven over centuries or millennia to work. And you understand that there's only one paradise and it's not on this earth, it's in the afterlife. So um, it doesn't matter what the labels are. At the end of the day, those people who wish to take our freedoms away from us, subscribe to this idea, Jan, that man is malleable and shapeable and can be perfected, which is, of course, asinine. It's, it's very interesting because it seems like, you know, the approach to this, the, the fallen man model, as you're describing, is actually one of empowering the individual curiously. Yes. Right? Yes. You, 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 you have to, if, if you believe in the perfectibility of man argument, who's going to do the perfecting? Mm. It's not the individual. It's the state. Yes. The elite is granted this magic power, the philosopher, philosopher king power to mold society as they deem fit. That's why the, the, the hoary old saying is so true. Big government, small citizen. The, the more you, 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 you cramp the individual and you remove from them the liberties we believe to be inherent and not, not government given, but God given, the more power you give to uh, an elite and unfortunately, in many cases, members of that elite aren't elected. And that's what we've seen in the last three or four years in America, that the, this concept of the deep state or the permanent state, these bureaucrats who say, well, presidents come and go, but I've been working in government for 20 years and I know better. That way, and this is not an exaggeration, that way eventually lies the re-education camps and eventually the gulag. You know, indeed, uh, yesterday I saw a headline in the New York Times. I don't know if you saw the same headline. It was an op-ed, basically something along the line, the deep state is real, but it's uh, the, the, a patriotic... They're the patriots. Deep... They're yes. the good guys. Right. right. Which, which, which is absolutely shocking. The idea, and I witnessed this when I was in the White House, for the first few weeks, I refused to use the phrase deep state. I thought it was a little bit outre, a little bit, you know, tinfoil hatty. And then I saw it in practice with my own eyes. I saw... I'd be at a meeting of the National Security Council, uh, you know, closed in a skiff in a secure uh, uh, facility, uh, classified facility, and you'd sit there for an hour and a half on some big issue of imp import to the president, whether it was how to defeat ISIS, the threat of China, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, whatever it was. And I sat there in a room with representatives of the administration and on the outstations, the secure uh, video teleconference screens, you name it, CIA, DIA, Joint Chief, State Department. And for an hour and a half, I sit there as an observer. And nobody mentions the name of the president, let alone what he wishes to achieve in that given issue. And there I am, the deputy assistant, who after 90 minutes, I'm the guy with the strange accent who goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I remind you of what the president said in Riyadh yesterday, can I remind you what, what he said in Warsaw with regards to Judeo-Christian civilization or the threat of China or how we defeat ISIS? And then you realize they don't care. They, they're, you know, the, the incumbent of the White House is irrelevant to them because they think, oh, the will of 63 million people. I, I, I'm a GS-15. I'm an SIS. I've been here for 15, 20 years. I'll be here once he's gone. That that rank arrogance is the antithesis of what our republic was founded on. And it's the antithesis of the principles that the founding fathers built this nation upon. So, you know, in the book, you describe a kind of indoctrination that's been happening in our, you know, in our school system yeah. across, across the board for decades now. Right. And there's one particular startling example you actually have. I think it's in the preface of the book. Yes. Um, you were at your daughter's graduation. Can you kind of describe this a little bit? I, I found it kind of stunning, but I'd love to hear it yeah. from you. So the prologue, and I'm very indebted to him, was written by my friend Dennis Prager, my, my colleague here at Salem Radio. And then I opened the book um, with, with this chapter that in part is really one of the reasons I wrote The War for America's Soul. 
So our eldest uh, graduated this year from college and uh, she had a rough time in college. Um, there was an accident at her college. Uh, she was severely injured with along, along with 30 other of her friends, but she persevered. She was co-captain of her crew team. She had four different jobs working for professors, managing the, the coffee shop. Um, and, and as a result of her, her persevering, it was all the more important for me that when she graduated, that it be her day. Everybody wants to be, the family wants to be there, but it's to celebrate her being summa cum laude, persevering through the, 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 the tough, the vicissitudes of the last four years. So I tried to avoid any kind of issue because I knew this was a liberal college. I knew some of the parents would not exactly be fans of the president or somebody who worked for the president. So I, I basically hid for the duration of the, of the graduation ceremony. I found a big tree to hide under in the quad where I could see the stage. I could see my daughter take a photograph, but I didn't want to be the focus of any distraction. Um, nevertheless, halfway through, it was just funny, the, the police officers from the college came up to me halfway through the ceremony. I thought, oh, what now? And the reason they wanted to come up is to get some selfies and say, hi, we know who you are, which was fun. Um, but it all goes down smoothly, beautiful day. And uh, afterwards I decided to you know, rejoin my, my group with my daughter and her diploma. And I get a bit separated from my family. And this little girl comes up to me, not one of the students because she didn't have a gown on, she was maybe 19 years old, maybe 95 pounds dripping wet. She walks straight up to me in a crowd of hundreds of people, witnesses, and says, are you Sebastian Gorka? Are you the Sebastian Gorka that worked in the White House? And I smiled, I reached out my hand, and I said, yes, that's me. To which this girl, this little girl, and I, I'm, you know, if you don't know, if you've never met me, I'm six foot four, 260 pounds, played rugby and judo, I'm not a small guy. And she says, well, in that case, F you, you effing Nazi. Now, I've become used to the political attacks, I get it. I'm associated with the president, uh, I, I'm conservative, I have a national radio show. But never before at this level of indoctrination had a young girl come up to me and, and, and did that. I was a little taken aback. I composed myself and I said, I'm not going to let this lie. So I followed her back to her family grouping and it looked like her mother was there and perhaps her grandmother. And I said to her, who the hell do you think you are? My parents suffered as children under Nazi occupation. My father, as an adult, was arrested and tortured by communists and put in prison. And you call me a Nazi? Who the hell do you think you are? Now, her relatives were shocked. The woman who looked like her mother said, did you really say this to this man? You know what her response was, Jan? And this is where it gets really highly disturbing. She had a rictus-like grin, like, like Joker from the Batman, and just smiled and grinned at me with no shame. That's why I wrote The War for America's Soul, to explain how in America, the country that people flee to for their freedom, you have a 19-year-old girl with that level of brainwashing behave the way she did in public at my daughter's graduation. That needs explaining. So, how about you explain a little? <laughs> and actually, it's, it's interesting. The book is, um, you know, kind of like a short primer on a number of areas. We talk about Spygate, what you call Obamagate. We talk about, actually, this road from Antonio Gramsci yes. into sort of the modern philosophy, educational environment. Can you tell us a little bit? Right. So, um, you're absolutely right. So, I, I start with... Dennis, then this story at the graduation, I moved to a chapter to really give people all the details on Obamagate, what the last administration did illegally to spy against candidate Trump and then President Trump. And then I move into a chapter on, okay, so what are the antecedents? What's the real reason? Because I get a lot of questions from conservatives when I travel the country. Right. How did this happen? How do we have a Democrat party that openly wants to take away our guns, is not only fine with trimester abortions, third trimester abortions, but infanticide afterbirth, a, a party that says we're going to pay taxpayer-funded medical insurance for illegal aliens. How did we get there? And I'm, my answer is, well, guess what? It didn't happen overnight. 
it wasn't a function solely of the eight years of Obama. And in large part, we are responsible. The right is responsible because we allowed them to implement a, a plan which they call the long march through the institutions. And in this, and I want, you know, I'll give a quick summary, but people really have to read the details in The War for America's Soul. I was stimulated, I was inspired by perhaps one of the most important books I've read in the last 20 years, which was Andrew Breitbart's right. Righteous Indignation. In chapter six of his autobiography, Andrew helped explain to me the antecedents. And I went a little bit deeper, I dug a little bit deeper, I, did, I made more connections, and I put that into my book. And it's very simple. Um, it starts, you know, AOC, Obama, Hillary can all be traced back to an Italian communist called Antonio Gramsci writing a book in a prison cell on, in Italy. And that connection goes through the Frankfurt School to Saul Alinsky to Hillary to Obama to AOC. And the key thing that these people did, and you can you know, read the names Adorno, Gramsci, uh, Lukács, uh, Alinsky, is they had an epiphany they realized the flaw in Karl Marx's writings and in Engels' writings. The, the attempt to create a communist nation failed almost exclusively in every single place it was tried, with the exception of countries like Russia or China, where there wasn't a developed middle class and where the so-called revolution could leverage a peasant class where there was a quasi-feudal class that was ill-educated and wouldn't resist the elite's revolution. So if you tried communist revolution in, in robust, healthy Western nations like America, they'd be doomed to failure because of the traditions, the strength of the family, civic society, and so forth. So what Gramsci and especially Alinsky managed to do is these... Uh, communist thinkers said, don't attack the Judeo-Christian institutions frontally. You'll never win. You will be destroyed because they're so healthy. They've been developing for thousands of years from the Greeks through the Romans through Christianity. What you do is you penetrate those institutions and you change them and you radicalize them from the inside. This is where we get Alinsky's community organizer. You organize inside of existing structures until you can radicalize them wholeheartedly from the inside. And that is exactly what they've done in America. If you look at uh, the key elements of our society, whether it's the press, whether it's Hollywood, uh, whether it's the education system, these institutions have been targeted over decades and they have been taken over by radicals. I mean, if, if you look at the fact that um, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation announced on my show yesterday, yesterday, the latest YouGov poll that they do every year, 70% of millennials are sympathetic to socialism. 70%. How do you get there in America? You only get there when you have an Anthony Zinn, an avowed America hater, his textbook, the People's History of America becoming the mandatory textbook because the teachers' unions, the leftists, say it has to be the mandatory textbook. How is it that you can go to an Ivy League college today in America to major in English literature and for four years not study William Shakespeare, who isn't the greatest Western author, he is the greatest literary mind of human society, human history, but you don't study him because he's white, he's male, and he's a heterosexual, and therefore he's an oppressor. This is what I wanted to explain. And, and the sad thing is, Jan, it's all demonstrable. This isn't you know, a theory, a hypothetical. These are names, dates, plans. And, and the last thing I do in the book, there's a, a bonus chapter, which is a, an interview I did with the president earlier this year. I went back to the White House right. and interviewed him. But then we found Hillary Clinton's original dissertation from Wellesley that she wrote on Saul Alinsky when she worked for Saul Alinsky. And I reproduce the actual pages of the dissertation in extract to explain how it is that this woman worked for and wrote on Saul Alinsky the man who dedicated rules for radicals. And please, don't take my word for this, anybody. Look at it. Dedicated his handbook for the revolutionaries to the first revolutionary, Lucifer. Dedicated his handbook to the devil. She studied under him. She wrote about him. And the only photograph you can find 
again, not an accident, of constitutional law professor Obama teaching is what? Is Obama on a chalkboard diagramming out Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals. This isn't a hypothetical. This is a plan that's been gestating for 80 years, and that's how we get to a Democrat party that is typ typified by radicals, communists, socialists, gun grabbers, um, anti-Semites like Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and that's what I wanted to explain in The War for America's Soul. So, you know, you have another kind of personal moment in the book that I'm just reminded of that, that you describe where I think you're eight years old yes. and, uh, you know, you see your father coming out of, I think you're in the, the ocean or right, something. Right. And you notice some marks on his wrist right. and that kind of profoundly impacts you. Yeah. Um, what, what, what was that all about? So I think for, for many people, it is possible to identify moments in your life where you, you, you arrive at a fork and everything changes because of an event or a decision you make. For me, my life truly, I can, I can identify it clearly to, to a matter of minutes. And it was on vacation in the south of France. So my parents escaped communist Hungary. My father literally was liberated from a political prison as an anti-communist. He was liberated. And with the 17-year-old daughter of a fellow prison mate, they crawled across a minefield into free Austria and then ended up as refugees eventually in the UK where I was born and raised. And that 17-year-old girl became my father's wife and my mother. Um, and I was born in, in, in Liberty, I, you know, the mother of democracies, the UK. I grew up under Margaret Thatcher. We were blessed. But one day on vacation, I was on the beach playing in the sand and my father, who was a, a great figure of a man, an athlete, he'd been on the, the national crew team for Hungary before he was arrested by the secret police. He loved to swim, he loved to exercise, and he came out of the, the water one day after a swim out of the ocean. And I looked at him, and I realized something I hadn't noticed before. And I saw these white lines on his wrist, wrists, and I realized he, he wasn't old enough to be wrinkled on his wrist. So like a silly little boy, I said, hey, Dad, what's that? And without batting an eyelid, with no emotion, with no hesitation, he just looked at me and he said, son, uh, that's where the secret police bound my wrists together with a wire behind my back so they could hang me from the ceiling of the torture chamber. That's when my life changed, Jan, because from that moment onward, I knew at a genetic level, at a visceral level, at the level of my soul, that the word evil isn't reserved for mythical stories of minotaurs and, and dragons. It's not about, you know, children's fables from Grimm. Evil is real. Evil lurks in the heart of men and is done by men onto other men, and evil walks the earth. And that background, my family's history, that experience shaped everything I do, whether it's my work in counterterrorism, understanding the jihadis helping our military and our intelligence uh, understand the jihadis, or whether it's facing down the enemies we have today, whether it's resurgent communist China or the radicals inside our own country, sadly. So, you know, you kind of often describe, you know, the left, right, as yeah. this kind of block, but I, maybe you can speak to this. It strikes me that there's some people, probably a smaller group that are kind of engineering everything yeah. that you've been describing here. But most people, maybe they can't imagine what it would be like to grow up in communist Hungary or communist yeah. Poland, where my parents escaped from back yeah. in the day. Um, it's extremely, it was extremely difficult for me to understand. Yeah. Um, uh, first, how many people in the left are part of this 80 year plan that you're describing? And, and what about the rest? So let me be very clear here, because on the right, we often um, do ourselves great damage by promoting or being susceptible to conspiracy theories. Uh, I love conspiracy theories as entertainment. Um, the reason they're called theories is because they're not facts. So the idea that there's you know, um, you know, Obama is the mastermind sitting in a cave somewhere with a joystick engineering a great left-wing conspiracy is absurd. A, number one, he's a very lazy man. So if there was a mastermind, it wouldn't be Obama. But I, th th there is no need 
for a super mastermind secret plan. Why? By dint of what left-wing philosophy is, the right conservatives are predicated on what? On the individual, on rugged individual, on, on the liberties of the man, the woman who makes decisions for themselves. Well, the left is the opposite. The left is predicated on what? The collective. The interests of the collective outweigh the interests of the one. Therefore, the left has, by, by nature of that philosophy, a collectivist mindset. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's, it's like a hive mentality. If you think of Star Trek, it's like the Borg. If, if you look at the media today, you don't need a master plan to smear somebody on the right or the president. When, when the left launches one hit piece, the Huffington Post or you know, Daily Beast launches a hit piece on you or the president or me, what happens? The hive mentality is to pile on. It's the mob mentality. You don't need a mastermind. You just need a collectivist mindset. So number one, um, it's more of a cultural aspect that allows them to mm. be so effective collectively than it is some kind of super plan. Secondly, um, I think you're right. I think most Americans are apolitical, in my opinion. And if you had to create a taxonomy, if you had to categorize most Americans outside of urban areas, I think they lean more towards conservative, mildly towards conservative. That's why most elections are about capturing that, that relatively apolitical middle. But what we've seen with the Democrat Party officially is it being captured by the radicals. Today, a John F. Kennedy, who was, you know, um, very hardcore anti-communist, strong on national security. A John F. Kennedy wouldn't be allowed into a DNC meeting, wouldn't be allowed to represent the party with his views. The idea that, you know, the DNC, Hillary Clinton is saying everybody and their grandmother is now a Russian asset, from the president to Jill Stein to a combat war veteran who's a woman, who's actually a Democrat <laughs> member of Congress, the, the DN, you, you'd, be, you'd be laughed out of the DNC 30 years ago for even mentioning something so McCarthyite. So I, I'm not going to try and estimate percentages, but, but what we have now is really a case of the lunatics have taken over the asylum, the ocasio Cortezes, the Rashida Tlaibs, the Ilhan Omars, the Bernie Sanders have, have captured the soul of the DNC. And the dangerous thing is we have no grown-ups left anymore. Uh, you don't have to like Bill Clinton, but at least in the 1990s, there was a pragmatist who would rein in the crazies, pull back on the reins a little bit, because the crazies have always been there. Today, who's, who's reining back the radicals on the left, Jan? It's not, it's not Nancy Pelosi. She, she surrendered. She's given in to this insane impeachment against the most successful president since Ronald Reagan, with no crime being predicated. He had a phone call with the president of the Ukraine about the mutual need to fight corruption. And that's what you're going to impeach him for when in 1999, Bill Clinton signed a treaty with the Ukraine that requires us together to help each other fight corruption. Uh, if you'd read these details in a fictional novel 20 years ago, you would have said the author is just, it's never going to happen in America. Yeah, and it's happening right now. So, you know, it's very interesting, uh, sort of, you describe uh, uh, President Trump as the most unlikely, uh, you know, president to win. I think you talk about it. This was interesting. I hadn't realized that literally no president has been elected that didn't have experience in government before. There, there's, there's, since 1776, we've never elected a president who wasn't either a general or a former politician. From Washington to Obama, everyone was a senator, congressman, governor, or a general like Eisenhower. The American people sent a very interesting message to the world when we said, OK, we've had it with that schlep. We want somebody who has no connections to the swamp. That was a historic moment that bears repeating. And you, uh, you know, just as you referenced uh, um, uh, uh, Breitbart's book, I mean, you're also referencing uh, J.D. Vance's yes. book on this kind of, you know, the change in middle America right. uh, that kind of, as you suggest, you know, resulted in President Trump. I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so um, I, I love to read. Uh, I'm a collector of, of books. Uh, um, 
but I hate autobiographies or biographies. I, I, I don't have patience. I'm not, I'm not interested in what Eisenhower had for breakfast on February the 12th, 1941. I just have no interest. But I've read one autobiography in the last 20 years, and it was seminal. And I thank Steve Bannon for, for telling me that I should read this. And I read it in one Thanksgiving weekend, and it's Hillbilly Elegy by, by J.D. Vance, who's, who's not a fan of the president. Let, let's be clear, J.D. Vance, uh, an international phenomenon with that book right. is not a Trump supporter, although I think he may change his mind soon given the attacks he's come under for the truth he's spoken about what's happened to America. And I read this story about a young man who, who lived as a, as a scion of a hillbilly clan that had moved to the Midwest and then tried his best to survive in, in, a, in a milieu where uh, the, these ancient clans were being destroyed by drug addiction, by the closing down of the factories that had provided them with prosperity. He went on to reinvent himself, become a Marine, and, and now a successful author. And what I did with Hillbilly Elegy is to step back and look at it from the lens of geostrategy and uh, politics, not, not as a personal story, but to understand what is the connection been between J.D. Vance and the election of the, of the president? And it's very clear to me. If you read the story of, you know, people on wealth, you know, J.D. Vance, age 16, age 15, loses his mother to a, a drug rehabilitation clinic. And right. he's raised by his 17-year-old sister. And to make some money, he becomes a cashier at the local grocery. And when he tells the story from that vantage point of, you know, the people rolling up to the, to the cashier's desk with a, a giant trolley full of... Uh, canned drinks, sodas that they buy with their EBTs, with their with their food stamps from the government, and then he watches them as they roll outside the store and sell the the, the food stamp acquired soda for cash, so they can buy alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs. Um, then then you realize there's a deeper story here, and the story is a very simple one: um, the left and the right fundamentally betrayed Middle America in the last. 60 years. Uh, and the, pe the people who talk of a uni party in DC, that's sound analysis. Um, I said it when I was in the White House as strategist to the president. I've said it since I left the White House. Donald Trump became president despite the GOP, not thanks to the GOP. Look at just the issue of China. Uh, the rise of China to become a near peer competitor to America as a communist nation was facilitated by what? By a Republican president who listened to Henry Kissinger, who said to Nixon, oh, you, you are the only man who could go to China. And then followed 50 years of what? Let's give China most favored nation status. Let's give it WTO membership. Let's, let's treat it as if it's a normal country and, and we'll, we'll, we'll base all of our policies on this absolutely absurd concept that if we economically liberalize our relations with a communist dictatorship, then it must become democratic in the end. What has happened in reality? We facilitated this country rising from the dirt to become one of the most powerful nations in the world that is destroying our economic advantage by exploiting our trade relations with them. So um, I wanted to use J.D. Vance's book to illustrate a broader geopolitical point. Right. And so this rise of China corresponded, I mean, very briefly, because we have to finish up yeah. fairly soon, corresponded with this almost like the, the total destruction of the heartland. Yes, and, and this surrender by the political elite on both left and right to this concept of managed decline, that we've surrendered, that other nations will eclipse us, whether it's the BRICS, whether it's Brazil, whether it's Russia, whether it's India or China, the, you know, the days of the West in ascendance are over and we're just going to resign ourselves. We can outsource jobs. Nobody needs to make steel in America. Everything we make by Apple can be outsourced to China. And that's how generations were destroyed. And then along comes a man, a billionaire from Manhattan, who says, I'm going to stand up for, for the forgotten men and women. And he connected with them. And that's how we elected the first non-politician, non-general to the highest office in the land. One thing that struck me, and this is, I think, a, a really great place to finish up, you mentioned that the right, yes. so to speak, is fueled by love, 
because I, I think most of the attacks on the right are, you know, actually you're a bigot, you hate <laughs> racist, all this kind of stuff. But you're you're postulating the exact opposite. Yeah. And how does can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, it's it's kind of my 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 call sign or the way I end uh, my radio show every day that I I say there is a massive difference between right and left today. That that they are fueled by hate hatred of this nation, hatred of their fellow man, hatred of you if you have a different skin color, a different sexual preference. Um, we conservatives are fueled by love. Love of what? Love of our nation. I, I, love of liberty. I've seen it in Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump wants you to be safe, wants you to prosper, irrespective of your skin color, irrespective of where you came from, irrespective of your socioeconomic class. He wants you to be safe and to prosper, even if you didn't vote for him, that's the conservative ideal, e pluribus unum. When you have political, um, when you have identity politics on the left drive your agenda, what are you going to do? You're going to look at everybody around you to define them. You're a man, you're a woman, you're homosexual, you're not homosexual, you're, you're white, you're brown, you're black. That's un-American. And that's why eventually we will win. Look at the footage of the president's rallies. Look at Minneapolis, 20, no, what was it? Dallas, 20,000 people inside capacity crowd, 30,000 outside wearing red MAGA hats. I love the photographs of everybody beaming. There was one guy closest to the camera, clearly Hispanic, smiling in his Trump hat, and everybody there was happy. I've seen it at Trump rallies. I doubt you would see the same at a Beto O'Rourke, at a Bernie Sanders rally. There it's about beating your oppressors. It's about anger. It's about who is the biggest victim. Americans, Jan, don't believe in victims. So how can someone, you know, reach out to the, yeah. the folks that you are postulating or fueled by hate, who I don't think imagine themselves to be? No, and they think that we are the evil ones. They dehumanize us. When you, when you look at the language of the left, it is an attempt to dehumanize us. And that is very, very dangerous. Think of the word Nazi. I've been called a Nazi every day on social media. When, when you call somebody whose parents suffered under fascists, under Nazi occupation of Nazi, what have you done to the content of that word? When everybody you disagree with is a fascist or a Nazi, you, you, you've denuded that word of any content. How do we um, respond to them? Uh, my little tip is a very easy one. We have to do what Reagan did. We have to have the facts behind us, but we have to connect at an emotional level. We have to speak to the soul, to the heart, as well as have the good argument. Another, another policy paper on the Laffer curve doesn't bring people over to your side. Um, you have to, for example, on the wall. The wall is deemed to be racist. And I say, you want to talk to a liberal about the wall? Ask them, do you know how many women, how many children are raped as they are smuggled across the border by the coyotes? Do you know that mothers in Mexico are renting out their two-year-old children at the cost of $400 a day to coyotes to pretend that when they bring people across the border, it's a family unit, and that child is then smuggled back to be rented out again? Do you know that 60 to 80% of young women are sexually abused or raped? And I say to them, talk to a liberal and ask them, do you want to protect children? You want to stop women being raped, don't you? Well, you know how to do that? Join us in building the wall. So you have to have the, the substance. You have to have the commitment to the objective truth. But politics today is, is, is really based upon making that emotive connection. And that's what I think, in many cases, the GOP has forgotten, but not the president. Seb Gorka, a powerful place to end. Thank you, and please check out The War for America's Soul and uh, my radio show, America First, at sebgorka.com, S-E-B-G-O-R-K-A.com. Thank you.